We've uh, we've already promoted. Oh, where did we go? We're live. Well, if, well, we'll get started. I, I think we're live. So, <laughs> uh, here with uh, Angie Renna after some technical difficulties uh, getting in. Uh, uh, it's the world we live in with Zoom. So, but uh, Angie Renna is the Republican candidate in the 50th State Senate District that includes. Uh, Cayuga and Onondaga counties, uh, most of the city of Auburn, for those of us in Cayuga County, uh, and then the towns of Brutus, Cato, Ira, and Senate, uh, and a big chunk of Onondaga County too. I, I know part, a little part of the city of Syracuse and a bunch of towns that I won't rattle off because that would just be, uh, <laughs> that would be too much, I think. But, but Angie, why don't we get us uh, started with uh, just an introduction, you know, get, get, tell, us, uh, tell us about yourself since this is the, the first Facebook Live interview we've done together. Well, first of all, Robert, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be in your presence and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here with you today and, and to all of your viewers. So um, thank you. And um, as far as you know, who I am, first and foremost, I like to start off with I'm a mom. I have uh, two wonderful sons who are, who are 23 and I feel I've done uh, along with their dad, a great job of raising them and um, we're very proud that they uh, went to college and came back here to start their careers and, and are staying close to home. And that's something, you know, in this, in this day and age, you don't see very much of. Um, so that's the first thing that, uh, that defines me. But then secondly, I'm a small business owner. Um, I moved up here about 26 years ago and always have had the entrepreneurial spirit inside of me uh, in one way or another. So um, I started uh, my own business and, uh, and have been blessed with uh, great opportunities and great clients and great staff. And um, it's through uh, really uh, doing that that I've uh, grown to love working with people, helping them start their own businesses, mentoring women who have the desire to do the same thing, you know, be a working mom and, and balance that, that uh, family life and, and work life balance, which is really difficult. And, um, you know, with that, with that opportunity to be a business owner, you always have the opportunity to reach out to the community and help. And so I've done that. I, uh, for many years, was part of a, um, I'm still a member, but on the board of uh, an organization that focuses on women in business and helping them uh, grow their, uh, their entrepreneurial spirit. But not all of those women own businesses. They're just looking for ways to grow in their uh, industry. And uh, I've been a, a part of that for many, many years and proud to be so. So, you know, it's always important to, to give back and uh, I'm a firm believer in that. And ultimately that's, ultimately that's why I'm running. It, it's time to give back. I've been really blessed in my life and, you know, you start to see how things are changing. And uh, we have a great opportunity here in, in central New York to, to make an impact and, and keep things going on, on the right direction. So um, that's why I'm running. Yeah. So, so to build upon that, I guess, what, what do you think uh, uh, you can bring to the state Senate for, for this district specifically? Obviously, uh, this is an open seat. Uh, so it's gonna be a, a wide open competition opportunity for, for you and your opponent, obviously, to, to really uh, you know, outline what, what, uh, how, how you would approach the, this job as state Senator. So, so how would you approach it? What, what uh, do you think you bring to the table? And, and how would you do the job? I think the, uh, you know, the primary reasons for why I wanted to run were a little, you know, were, were one set of reasons prior to COVID. Um, but really, even during COVID and, and when we look beyond COVID, are going to be the, the same primary reasons, which are first, public safety. Um, my family members are, are in law enforcement and, and have done a uh, tremendous uh, job with a long career in, in law enforcement, and um, we support law enforcement, and that's really important for people to know out there. Um, and one of the reasons why I decided to run was because of uh, uh, public safety, keeping our families and our kids safe. And when we see some of the legislation that's passed um, over the last couple of years, uh, public safety is going in, in, in a different direction. And we really need to uh, pull back the reins on that and, and, and get control back because we want to make sure our kids are safe when they're when they're out on the street. And we're seeing some really terrible headlines, uh, especially uh, 
uh, right now. And, um, you know, that's, that's going to be a primary focus, uh, working through the bail reform, um, the discovery laws that were passed that are not perfect. Um, they need a lot of work. So we want to focus on that. Um, but, you know, also when we're hearing the, the anti-police rhetoric, um, really bringing back into focus all of the good work that our men and women in blue do is really important. And I want to work on that. Um, but then secondly, we've got a great opportunity here in central New York to, um, to really develop um, economically what we can do uh, through small business development and, and encouraging um, new growth in different areas and as well as peeling back some of the regulation that makes it really hard. New York State is not known for a great business climate. Uh, New York City has benefited by the fact that it's just New York City, and so that's where businesses go. But in uh, central New York and upstate New York, we suffer um, because we have to attract business here for different reasons. And it's very difficult when you're within a state that has high taxes, high regulation, and really a, um, a business climate that's not uh, going to attract uh, out of state and, and um, other, other opportunities within the business world. And that's really what's going to help keep our kids here. If we can grow our, our uh, economy and provide these opportunities for good paying jobs for our kids, then they're gonna stay. And that's what we really wanna see. We, we've seen so much of this out migration, especially when you get to um, a retirement uh, phase of life. My business is, is retiring people. I, I, I've uh, um, done this for, for many, many years. Financial planning is, is the crux of my business. And I work with a lot of people on, on helping them retire. But what ends up happening is they're looking for uh, uh, another place to live that is lower in taxes and maybe more affordable health insurance. And, and sometimes it has to do with good weather, but that's not always the case. Um, and so we're seeing an out migration in that regard. Uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, a growing population here of really good qualified candidates that, um, that we can put to work and that we can give them really good paying jobs. And that's going to help um, fuel the fire of, of the economic development that we need to see here. And that's gonna provide our families uh, with, with a great quality of life. People are gonna be able to put food on the table. And it's really difficult to have that conversation right now among um, COVID-19. We still have a lot of businesses that haven't been able to open up like our gyms, our bowling alleys, our movie theaters. Um, and uh, so they're really feeling the pain right now. But we're hoping that when we get past this, that we can really focus on not just getting these businesses back open and getting our, um, our um, people back to work, but also to encourage new business growth so that there's more opportunities. And you know, think about the kids that are going to, to school in the great um, colleges around town. They're, they're from out of town. We have an opportunity to grab those folks and, um, and grab their talent and, uh, and, and, and really invigorate the talent pool here in central New York. So we wanna really do some good work on focusing in that area. Um, and then, you know, if I was going to do a top three, obviously the third has to be fiscal sanity. Uh, we were before COVID-19, we were coming in with a six billion dollar budget deficit, and that's blown right out of the water. Now, forget that. I mean, we're we're at 16, 17 billion. I'm sure at this point, if not more, we're losing a lot of revenue because businesses aren't up and running fully. Um, you're hearing, you know, with the with the localities. Um, their budget issues, we've got decreases in sales tax. Um, but before COVID, we already had a problem. And to fix that problem, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my Democrat friends think that we have to raise taxes in order to fix that problem. That's not true. That is not going to encourage people to stay here. That is not going to encourage business development and economic growth. We have to do the opposite. We have to focus on the economic growth, that in turn is going to drive the train through some, some opportunity for more revenue to come in through sales tax. And it's gonna be a trickle down economic effect to all of our small businesses. And so um, we really need to 
dive deep into the budget and figure out what's going wrong. And it's been happening for many, many years. It's a very difficult situation um, to look at and say, oh, that is the one issue that's causing our budget to be in a $6 billion budget deficit. But it can be done and it needs to be done. And it needs to be done in a, um, you know, in a bipartisan way. We need to work across the aisle together to really figure out what we can do um, to, to get our budget back in line. And it's going to take probably a couple of years, you know, at this point to really do that unless we get some federal money. And we can talk about that if you want, but you, you know, that's been in the headlines quite a bit. And, uh, you know, at this point, it, it's almost uh, a, a real Hail Mary. We really need some federal stimulus to come through our way to really um, give us any fighting chance at this point. I do want to get back to public safety, uh, but I, I, let, let's let's talk about COVID nineteen because obviously this has uh, many different impacts. I mean, we we see the health crisis part of it, obviously, uh, but also the economic. Uh, and uh, uh, you mentioned you know the, the impact on government budgets. Certainly, we've seen that uh, locally, but uh, with the uh, you know with the state's approach, I guess what do you think needs to be done to to address these areas because this is still very much uh, an ongoing pandemic. Uh, it's not over yet. Uh, and uh, the economic crisis is still ongoing. We, you know, there's just in, in New York, uh, unemployment uh, uh, is over 10%. So, uh, you know, in terms of addressing, you know, the, the health and, and the economic, I guess, what do you see as uh, state policies that, that can help that process along? Yeah, well, we're going to need to we're not going to need to rely on I think our, our federal partners as well in this, quite honestly, because if you look at it, Robert, we need a lot of PPE funding to just get our kids back to school. You know, somebody had asked me that on Facebook uh, yesterday. You know, what's your plan if you want the kids to go back to school? Which I do. I want them to be safe. I that's the primary goal. But I I do believe that our kids need to get back to school. But what is it going to take to get them there? And we know um, that masks are working. And so we need money for PPE. We need money for proper ventilation, especially in some of our older schools. Um, we need testing, money for testing, ongoing testing. That's gonna be part of our life, unfortunately, for, for quite some time, um, just to make sure that we are really over, you know, over this hurdle. Um, so we're, we're, you gotta look you know, forward into 2021 before you really get an idea of, um, you know, what COVID means. Uh, but we have to prepare for it. And those are things that, um, that really uh, has, it's not been done. It's, let's be frank, it's not been done. Uh, when you look at the budget, there's a lot of wasteful spending. And, um, and you know, we, we really need to tailor that back. But we need to prioritize. And when you look at COVID-19 and, and where that's taking us, PPE is going to be a big budget buster from the state level all the way on down to the localities. And where are we going to get that money? It's going to have to come from some, uh, some federal support, as well as just tightening up um, the reins on some other exp expenditures. And you're seeing across the board layoffs, um, you know, in different counties, and uh, people are having to make hard decisions. But guess what? You know, it's unfortunate. But that, that happens in a lot of different areas where you have to make tough decisions. People are doing the best that they can during this time. And you know, my job as a legislator would be just to continue to support and make really good decisions on behalf of my community. And that's what I plan to do. Uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to public safety, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about how do you balance the, you know, I, I think I think voters of, of all stripes would say they, they want their communities to be safe. Uh, you know, on the other hand, there's this you know ongoing discussion about racial justice and and the need to uh, you know address uh, whether it's systemic racism or police brutality or you know the list goes on. So you know how do you how do you balance the um, uh, you know the the public safety agenda you know part of your platform with you know the need to address these. Uh, systemic issues that have been uh, obviously a long-standing problem. Yeah, well, you know, at first, let's really just start with bail reform. Um, 
and it's not a racial issue so much for me. It's it's a it's a poverty issue. You know, it's it, what why do we want bail elimination? It's because people can't afford bail. And the people that are doing really low level, low offense crimes that cannot afford bail should not sit in jail, um, whatever, whatever race you are. And that's a good thing. And that's where the foundation of bail reform can be. Um, but what ended up happening, as you know, is there was a long list of crimes that were eligible for no bail that should not have been on that list. Um, those that may not necessarily be completely, um, or, you know, like, mo uh, so, so evidently violent, but could turn violent. Um, crimes that we know that we have repeat offenders and, um, and will continue to repeat on those crimes. And then, uh, unfortunately look to, to some more serious crimes down the road. Uh, there were, there were. Uh, crimes that were uh, bail eliminated that were offenses against children that should never have been on that list. That was, it just was a bad bill. And it was a bill that was passed through the budget, as you know. Um, and then on top of that, they passed the, as part of that was the discovery laws. And I can tell you that um, that was a very uh, painful process for a lot of our local uh, police departments. And in, in the city of Syracuse, when you have the kind of crime rates that they have, their, their crime lab, the county crime lab was always um, backed up to begin with. So then to put a time constraint on, on those uh, uh, evidence uh, technicians and, and the detectives to get this um, information uh, through discovery in a 15 day time period, which was the original law, was just, it, it was just ridiculous. It, in some cases, you just cannot do that. But they didn't have those conversations with the law enforcement partner. So uh, they didn't know, you know, they're just, you know, legislator politicians that have uh, career politicians that have been there. And instead of having the conversation of, we want to make sure that we're making things equitable for people. Can you help us figure that out? They didn't do that. And they should have. So, um, but what's really concerning to me with the bail reform and the discovery laws, what ended up happening was um, it, it allowed people to think that they could uh, just continue to do crimes, even if they were low level, without really any consequence. And so you're seeing a rash of increase in crimes because there's no consequence. And unfortunately, if you look, you're, um, some of the, the offenders are uh, very young. We just saw an article um, of a report yesterday of a 12 year old stealing a car, crashed it into a telephone pole. He's in the hospital. Um, and you know, bail reform may not touch him necessarily, um, especially when you're looking at the age of the, uh, of the um, offender. But in some ways it, it does because they know that they're just gonna, uh, in a lot of cases, get off without, uh, without any consequence. So. Uh, we're seeing an increase in crime just from that. But what's um, also something that no one's talking about is sometimes you arrest somebody and you put them in jail overnight because uh, they're intoxicated or they have a drug problem and they are just out of their mind on drugs. When you put that person into jail overnight, that's, that starts a detox problem, a detox uh, uh, situation that helps those people with their problem. And then while they're in jail, they're given the resources to continue to get help for whatever their problem is. When you're no longer able to do that and keep somebody overnight, uh, they're not getting the help. And now we've got uh, mental health issues as well as addiction issues that are going unchecked because we're not able to keep those people overnight and, and give them the help that they need. It's not just a, a, a matter of incarceration. Hey, we want to lock you up and throw away the key. That's, that's not all that the, the, the justice system does. It also provides people with a pathway for help. And so we're missing that opportunity um, greatly, I think. And that's a conversation that we should be talking about more, but we don't. You know, in terms of in terms of the crime, because I know, uh, you know, bail reform has been, uh, you know, certainly a, a lightning rod, if you will. Uh, but how much do you think that uh, 
this pandemic, uh, you know, people being home uh, and especially uh, people being unemployed that, you know, the jobs aren't there, you know, obviously concerns about, you know, their financial situation, whatever. How much do you think that that has that contributed to, you know, some of the crime issues that we've seen in different parts of the state? I, I'm certain that it has um, in, had a huge effect. Um, you know, when you think about people are bored. The weather's really, first of all, let's be honest, when the weather's nice, we see, we see increase in crime. That's just how it's historically always gone. People come outside more. But now if they're not working and not everything is open, uh, from a business standpoint, they're bored, uh, of course, you know, it, it provides for an opportunity for someone to do something that they may not have done otherwise. Um, but a lot of the cases that we're seeing are really, uh, you know, gang related. We're seeing a huge increase in gang related crimes and, uh, and affecting younger kids. You know, when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, you're looking for something. You're looking for someone to just pay attention to you and, and be accepted. And unfortunately, the streets have a death grip on our kids and they fall victim to, um, to feeling like that's the place that they can be accepted and they're doing things that they wouldn't normally do. Um, so, you know, COVID has a part to play in that. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, bail reform, COVID, and then uh, anti-police rhetoric is all contributing factors of the increase of crime that we're seeing. So we can place a blame on anyone or all three, but the fact of the matter is, it's a conversation that needs to continue to be had. We have to fix it because you and I, my kids, you know, mom and dad down the street, we're all worried about our safety. And it doesn't matter what neighborhood you live in, whether you're living in the city of Auburn, the city of Syracuse, or one of the suburbs in Cayuga County, um, it, it leeches. It leeches over borders into our towns and it affects us all. So we have to all be um, really uh, vigilant about having good conversations on how we, how we address this. It's a big issue. Uh, I did wanna ask uh, you know, a question that uh, leading up to the primary election, I asked uh, all the candidates about, and then that was uh, how this pandemic has affected uh, your campaign, because uh, certainly uh, in your case, uh, there was going to be a special election uh, in April that was pushed back and then eventually canceled. Uh, so I, I'm sure that that's part of the equation for you too. But, uh, you know, just with, uh, obviously there's restrictions, you know, the health concerns, you know, economic concerns as well. Uh, how, how is that, uh, how is all that affected uh, your campaign? Yeah, well, listen, since I'm not a politician and I've never campaigned before, I don't know if I really know any better, um, but I do know that I'm not able to get out and uh, shake hands and, and kiss babies and do the, all those traditional things that people get to do during campaign time. Um, so, you know, we're missing out on that. We're missing out on the opportunity to really get out in the community and uh, talk to people. And, uh, you know, that's unfortunate. But we rely, just like everyone else is, on, on this type of technology, on our social media campaigns. We started a podcast that my team would be um, very mad at me if I didn't tell you that we started our own podcast a few weeks ago called CNY Matters with Angie Renna. And so it's an, another opportunity to be able to talk about um, current issues and, and what people want to hear about. And we have special guests and, and give people the opportunity to to um, talk with us and share their thoughts and ideas because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not running for me, I'm running for the community. Um, I, I work for all of you. So, um, you know, it's really important that we have that dialogue and in a campaign time is when you really get a good vibe from people about what the issues are that they care about. And when you can't go door to door, you miss out on that opportunity. Uh, so we try to open up the avenue through social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as uh, the podcast, but you know, there's some things that we can get out to and um, and practice social distancing and wear our masks and and do things. I'm doing a lot of volunteering. Uh, I just did a um, a tremendous job uh, from the American Dairy Association. I got to give them a shout out. Um, and they've been going to all different towns doing their milk delivery. But it's not just milk. 
Robert, if I tell, I couldn't believe the operation uh, the other day. We were giving out to each car a box like this big full of meat, another box that big full of produce, uh, four gallons of milk, another box full of dairy, um, like yogurt and, and cottage cheese and things like that. And, uh, you know, 2,000 cars in that day were, were served, 2,000. And they're doing it, you know, almost on a weekly basis. And as these people were coming through the line, they were saying, you know, this is only going to get me through a couple of days, but thank, thank God that you guys are doing this. And what an inspiring thing to be able to participate in and see firsthand really the detriment that COVID-19 has, has it, how, how it's impacted uh, detrimentally to our families in our community. And we all should be, you know, volunteering and rolling up our sleeves and doing that. Um, so I, you know, we, we're constantly out there volunteering and, and doing the work with our community because that's the most important thing. Well, to close uh, with the, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm sure we'll talk again, uh, uh, you know, on this platform, but, you know, over the next uh, two and a half months, really, I think we're at now, uh, you know, what, uh, <laughs> what, what will that sprint be like for you? And, uh, you know, what, what can we expect from from your campaign going forward? It is a sprint, and you hit it, you know, earlier about the special election. I mean, I jumped into this uh, kind of late in the game, and it was going to be a sprint to the special election in April. I only would have had, I think, two months to campaign uh, for that, and uh, then it got delayed to June. So it was like another sprint uh, in the midst of COVID to get to June. And then the governor canceled it. We've been sprinting this whole time. I mean, we've been working so hard and, uh, and we will continue to do so. So now it's a matter of really focusing in on what matters most to everybody and making sure we get our message out there. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we know that as a first time uh, candidate, not everybody knows my name. This certainly will help. Um, and we need to continue to make sure that, that people are learning about me and that, they want to come out and vote for me. And that's going to be the most important thing from now until November 3rd. Angie Renner, Republican candidate in the 50th Senate District. Angie, thanks again for, for joining Thank us today. Thank you, Robert. It was great.